Okay, so we've got our we've got our worksheet open, and we're going to be uh, creating a user form to be able to edit one record at a time. So let's get down to business. So I'm going to open my Visual Basic Editor, Alt F11, and I will insert a user form. So we're starting from a brand new blank user form. I'm going to change a couple of properties of the user form. First one is I'm going to change the name of the user form. I'm going to call it FRM Product. Remember that when we name objects in, in the user form, we're going we're to typically prefix them all with a three-letter prefix. And I'll change the caption. You've got a form that says user form one. That's not going to make your user too happy. So I'll change the caption here to like edit product information or something. All right, now first step is I'm going to decide which of this information I want to, you know, I want to bring up. Ultimately, I'll probably bring it all up. But let's look first at this product number. I want the user to be able to edit any the current price, the manufacturer, department, edit any of that stuff except the product ID. Don't be changing the product ID. Look, you want a different product ID? Make a new product. Put the information in. Don't change a product ID. And so this is going to be a little bit different because I want to put something on, this, on the, the form that the user cannot change. So let's do that one first. Which control do I use when I want the user to be able to see text but not modify it? Yeah, it's the label right here. In fact, before we put on the, the ID itself, let's go ahead and bring on just a label for the ID. And I'll just call it like prod uh, pound sign or something. So for the caption on this one, I'm going to call it prod number, P-R-O-D pound. Now, hmm. It turns out it is, a, it is an ironclad rule. If you are going to refer to one of these controls on the screen, if you're going to refer to it through code, give it a standard name. However, if it's just going to be sitting there displaying something, you don't refer to it through code, you can probably get by leaving it with a default name and you're okay. And so I'm going to leave this one called, I'm going to leave it named label one, and I'm okay with that. So I brought on a label, I changed the caption to prod pound, and that's all I'm doing so far. But you're right, I want to use a label as well to actually display the information. And so I'll bring another label on. This one I am going to refer to through code, so let me name it LBL ID. So I'm going to have product ID, it's a label, so LBL ID. And the caption that I have here, hmm, this doesn't really matter because immediately when this form opens, I'm going to replace it with something. So maybe I'll leave that as label too. Um, and again, we'll be changing that through code. But here, what I do want to do is I want to do something to cue to the user that this is a data field even though they can't edit it. And so right now, I'm not sure that, that looks, you know, it might not be data, it might be metadata. It might be, you know, the name of some field or something. And so let's go ahead and make it look differently. The first thing I'm going to do is put a border around it. So it, with that selected, there's a property called border style. And I will change the border style to one. It's going to have a single border. Border style of this label I'm setting to one. I'm going to also going to give it a background color. It already has a default background color here, but I'm going to change it to be just a little bit darker to make it, you know, just kind of signal to the user, this is a little bit darker, it's not editable. Now, when I drop down the list of colors, I, I have two options. I can either choose a color from the palette or from the system. So if I choose it from the system, what this is saying is, listen, if the user has some funky color scheme set up, I just want to match it. Give me the same color, whatever their button background is, I want to be able to make that this. So the button face color, whatever they have chosen for that, I can choose that. I don't want to get it. I don't want to be involved with that. I always want this to be dark gray, regardless of how the users configured their, their windows colors. And so I'll come over here to the palette section, and I'll just choose a little bit darker gray. I'm choosing the third button down here on the left. And so that's going to make it look a little bit darker. I can still read the data just fine, but I'm queuing the user. This is not editable. And I think I want to center that as well. So fortunately, there's a thing called text align down here that I can use to change that to be aligned center. That's number two is aligned center. All right. So I've got, I've got the, the, the uh, controls configured to be able to deal with my product number. 
Next, let's go ahead and bring on the product name. So I'll just copy my product label or bring on a new label. And this one I'm going to call, I'll just call name, I guess. Oops, double click, didn't mean to double click. Come to the caption property, and I'll call this name, the name of the product. I call it product name or name, that's fine. Now, if I have some text that I do want the user to be able to change, what control do I use for that? It's actually called a text box in VBA, and it's just the next one over. So I'll just select that, and I will bring it over here, draw it in. This one, again, I'll be referring to it through code. And so I will change the, cap or I'll change the name to TXT name. I don't have to change the caption. There is no caption property, but the value is blank by default, and that's fine. It doesn't really matter because I'm going to be changing the value of this when the form first opens anyway. Questions? How are we doing? All right. All right. So far, it's pretty much review. We did a little bit extra with this label, but same controls. Question. Oh, is there a question? Is there a hotkey to go from this to the properties window? The answer is F4 will bring up the, will, will activate your properties window. Um, but I don't know if there's a hotkey that takes you back to this. Uh, question, go ahead. What did we configure on label two? Is that your question? Yeah. We set three prop, we set four properties on label two. We changed the name. We changed the background color. We changed the border style. Background color, we just picked a darker gray. Border style, we set to one. And we changed the text align to two, just to center it. And, and the reason I did that is because there's no border at all on this. Um, a, a, there's, no, there's kind of no margin. And so if you have something flush left on a label, it bumps right into the border which I'd prefer not to have. So I like to have that. When there's a border on it, I usually like to center it. Or if that doesn't make sense, you can always just write a space into the, into the caption when you're writing something. But it'd be nice if there was some way to set some kind of internal padding on it, but you can't. All right. Let's go ahead and, and review the one more control that we worked with last Wednesday, and that is the command button. So here's the command button. And we're going to bring that on, it'll just be our OK button. I'm going to change it to CMD OK. The name will be CMD OK. And the caption will be OK. So far, pretty normal stuff. Let's go ahead and put some code behind that OK button since we need it to do something. We'll have, it, we'll have it just unload the form. So to get to the code behind any one of these controls, I just double click the control. I have to select it first and then double click it. And it says, oh, clicking on a command button, you're writing some code for a command button. It guesses that click is the event we want. It's absolutely right. And I'm just going to unload this form, take it out of memory, unload me. Remember that I can refer to a form either by its name, in this case, FRM, I forgot what I called it. The form is called, or FRM product, or if the code is inside the form, I can use the, the alias me. So me just is a reference to whatever form the, co the, the code is in. All right. So it's pretty boring at this point, but I should be able to open this up, type something in, say OK, have it close. Doesn't do anything with what I typed in, but we've got the form articulating. So now let's have it read in these first two values. Ooh. Now we've got to figure out how do we make this read something? How do we make this actually put information onto the form? Now we did something with this the last time we were together. We made this uh, user form to collect a username and a password, or an email and a password. And on that one, we said, listen, when we open this form, you know, so we've got some code outside of the form that's opening the form. 
go ahead and open it, and then let's put some values, or, or load it into memory, and then let's put some values onto the form. That made sense in that context, because we might want to put a different username each time we open it. But in this case, we want it to behave the same way every time. So it doesn't make so much sense to have that code outside of the form. That code belongs inside the form. So we've got to pick an object and an event to make that code execute. I'll give you the object. The object that you want is the user form itself. And so if you just double click the background of the user form, it'll bring up user form click. We don't want that one. But it'll at least give us the right user form here. Now what I want you to do is look over the list of events that the form can respond to and tell me which event do you think it is. Which event? I think I heard it over here. Say it get louder. Initialize. Yeah, so when the user form gets initialized, that event is triggered when the for form is first coming off the disk and being read into memory. Remember, there's three states the form can be in. It can be unloaded, just sitting on disk. It can be loaded, but not visible. Or it can be visible. And so when it goes from not being loaded into memory, just sitting on disk to being loaded into memory, that's when this initialize event happens. So I'm going to select the initialize event. We've got this user form click. I'm going to get rid of that procedure. don't need it. And this is now code that will be executed when the form is first read into memory. So it can go into memory. It can then be shown, be visible. And then if I use hide, it makes it invisible. It leaves it in memory. The next time I show it, would the initialize execute again? No, it only executes when it first comes into memory. What, well, what if I want something to execute every time it becomes visible? Visible, invisible, visible, invisible. Different event. Which event is it? That event is called activate. So the activate is the one that gets executed when it gets, whenever it becomes active. And it, and it, it can become active for different reasons. Like I could have it visible, but have another form open. As I go back and forth between them, it'll get activated. But in the way that we're using it, we bring it up, don't let them open up any of their forms until they close it, and activate will get executed when it becomes visible. So, so the question is, when does this form get initialized? And the answer is, when, it, when in the code, you've got some code that says to load the user form, load FRM product. That would call initialize. It doesn't display it on the screen because loading it just brings it into memory. And then when you say, you know, the name of the form, form product.show, it would make it visible and, and so forth. I now, also. that's right. If I say show without having loaded it, it'll load it first and then show it. And so if I say show and it's not loaded in memory, it will trigger this code to be executed as well. Question in the back. If you say show and it's not loaded, it will load it so that it can show it. That's correct. Activate is when the form becomes active. So, so for us, if you want to say, well, I don't want this to execute when it gets initialized, but every time it becomes visible, then you would put that in activate. There, there are other times that a form can get activated, but it deals when you've got multiple forms visible at the same time. If you go back and forth between them, they both get activated. OK. So let's do this. I'm going to need to keep track of, w of a couple of things. I want to keep track of the active worksheet that I'm dealing with, and I want to keep track of which row I am on that sheet. And so I'm going to declare a couple of variables up here as module level variables. So let me dim row as, an, uh, as a long, and let me dim s as a worksheet. And let me go ahead and initialize those when, this, when the form it's initialized. Let's set their initial values. So first thing I want to do is I want to bind my S variable onto my worksheet that has my data on it. That's called products. And so set S equal to worksheets sub products. And then I'd like to make sure that's the active sheet. So S.activate. Oh. Pretty well want that to be the active sheet when the user is working on this data. Now I would like to read the, I'd like to find out which row has the active cell on it. So let's say row equals active sheet 
dot row. I'm sorry, active cell dot row. Whichever cell is active, which sheet is that active cell going to be on? Well, at this point, it's got to be on the product sheet because we activated it. That is the active sheet. Whatever cell was active before, we don't care. Now it's going to be whatever row we're talking about on this particular sheet. All right. So now I'm ready to use the sheet that I'm dealing with and the row that is currently selected. Oh, let's see. So the point is, you know, whichever row the user is on, that's the one we want to edit. Well, what do we do if the user is on the first row? We want, do we want to actually load the headers into our form? Probably not. So let's just do a little check right here. If row is equal to 1, then we'll do something. What do we do? Row equals 2. Just push us down to the next row. And then let's go ahead and select that particular row. So s dot, or just cells. Hmm. Let's just go ahead and select whatever column they're on. We'll leave them in that column, but let's just push them down one row. So the cells sub, the row we want is row 2. We'll just call it row row. Row, row, row your boat. Row. Um, and the column we want is the active cells column. And we'll select that. S-E-L-E-C-T. So the reason I didn't just put a 2 here is that the other thing I'd like to do, we won't have time to get to it today, but it might make sense to say, well, you know, I could be too high on the data, but I could be too low on the data as well. So I could have another little block in here that checks to see if I don't have any data down there, then set the row up a little bit higher, uh, and then we would do that. I guess that wouldn't be inside this block, though. No, that's fine. Okay. Now we're ready to say, let's pull the data off the row that we have specified by our row variable. First step is to fill in the information onto this label right here. The name is LBLID, and I want to change the caption property. And so I will say me.lblid.caption is going to get a new value. What's this value going to be? S.cells. So S is the worksheet I'm talking about. Cells, which cell do I want? Cell, or which row do I want? Row number row. Column number one is where the product ID is. And I want the value of that, of that cell. We'll do something very similar for the text box. As it turns out, folks, tell me, just guess. If I didn't tell it which form the, ca the control was on, which form would it assume I was talking about? If I, don't tell, if I don't tell it me, I mean, I'm telling it where to find the label ID. I'm saying, look at, the, look at me. Look at the form that holds this code. If I don't tell it that, which one do you think it'll pick? Yeah, it'll pick me. You know, one that has the code. So I don't have to put it there. It's, sometimes it's nice because you might go, ah, I don't really remember what that control is called, me dot, and then you get the list. And it's especially nice if you're, if you're saying, I know it's a text box, you could say me.txt, and that takes you right to the list of all your text boxes because they all start the same. Then you say, ah, I'm talking about the txt name. Then you can say, I don't want dot .caption, I want dot .value. And then that's going to equal uh, the value that we've got in column number 6. We'll have that value in there. That should get us started, folks. You should be able to run this form now, and it should bring up the information, at least the ID and the name, for whichever is the currently active which, whichever row has the currently the, the active cell in it. So if I run this, I get invalid use of property. Oh, I need to say equals there on both of these. Thank you. Caption equals. They're properties. If there were methods, I could get by without the equal sign. Uh, they'd be you know, parameters that are getting passed to the method. But here they're, here they're properties. Did I hear a sigh of release? People were looking at this going, I don't quite understand that syntax. Yeah, yeah. Equal sign important. There we go. So now, you know, here I am on row number two. It's telling me product number two. Um, that's just a coincidence that's the same number. And then we get the name, the custom brass banded spec clear. Question? Uh, you just said crap? Did I have yeah, you got dim s. S is a module level variable. Dim s as worksheet. 
And the idea is both of these that we have at the top, I'm going to want to be, I'll, I'll refer to them here when the form's initializing, but I also want to refer to those when the form, when we save. So ultimately, when the user clicks OK, we're going to have to write these values back out to the form as well. All right. So let's, let's go ahead and let's go ahead and save these out right now. So these are really pretty simple. There's only one that we have to save out because the user can't change this one, but they could change this one. Instead of clear, we might change the translucent. It's not really clear. Someone complained, it's not really clear. Yeah, it's just translucent. We'll call it translucent, that's fine. So when we click OK, what do we want to do at this point? We click OK, we want to save that. I mean, right now it doesn't do anything. It closes the form, but it doesn't change my data. It still says clear. When we opened the form, we read from the worksheet and put it into the control on the form. When we click Save, we just want to reverse that process. So I'm going to come up here to the OK button. I guess we're clicking OK. And I'm just going to, in fact, I can just take that, I can literally just take that line and reverse it. So before I read from the worksheet and put it into the form, now I'm going to read from the form and put it into the worksheet. So now you should be able to open that, make a change on the form. When you click OK, it should change the, change the worksheet in the appropriate location. Translucent. And that's now been changed. Translucent. 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 Yeah, that's right. OK. That's generally the approach. We've got to read the data from the form, put it, or read the data from the sheet, put it onto the form, we'll click Save, we go the opposite direction. It turns out the text box is, the, is really the only really easy one. Because if you think about it, that cell is pretty much like a text box, right? Just type whatever you want into it. These other ones that we're going to configure are going to be a little more difficult. So let's start off with our, uh, our departments. So here, there's only like four different departments. It's hunting, general, and apparel, and outdoor is what they are. And we look down, we'd find all, all four of them. So hunting, outdoor, general, and apparel. And so there's several ways that I can choose from a particular set. So let's go ahead and take um, the way called an option button. So let's look at this guy right here. This is called an option button. Sometimes it's called a radio button. It's because like on your radio, you can have like 12 different presets on your radio. But when you press one of them, if another one was selected before, it unselects that one. You can only have one radio station playing at a time. Thank goodness. Same thing in option buttons. I can have a whole set of option buttons, and the act of selecting one will unselect the rest in that set. Now, if I just put these option buttons directly onto the form, they're all going to be in the same set. But if I want to be able to have two different sets of option buttons, pick one from this set, pick one from this set, then I've got to put them in a frame. And so we'll do that first. So the frame is this control right here. It looks like a little square with XYZ written on the top of it. I'm just going to select that and do a click and drag to build that frame. I'm going to change two properties of the frame. I'm going to change the name from frame 1 to FRA department, or just D-E-P-T, FRA debit. And the caption I will spell out as department. And so you'll see now that the, whatever I put for the caption shows here at the top, and it's named FRA debit. Now, with that frame selected, I'm going to create four option buttons. So I'll select the first one, and I'll draw it in there. So there's my first option button. I'm going to give it a name. I'm going to call it OPT General. It's, my, it's the general department. And the caption will just be general. I'm changing two properties on each of these, on each of these 
option buttons that I'm creating. Now I'm just going to copy. I can, I can create each separate ones, but I'm just going to copy that three times. Need a little more room in my frame. And I'll configure each one of these in a similar way. So first one was general. Next one I'm going to make OPT apparel. And the caption is going to be apparel. Next one will be hunting. OPT hunting, caption hunting, and last one is outdoor, caption is OPT outdoor, and, or see, I'm sorry, name is OPT outdoor, caption is outdoor. Now, each one of these option buttons has a value property. A value is either true or false. And so, now here's the trick. I've got to look at something that's actually spelled out, general. And I've got to say, okay, when it says general, I want to make a particular one of these option buttons value to be true. It's a little bit more involved than just say, set this equal to whatever value is there. So let's take a look at that one. So I'm going to come over to my initialize, and we're going to set up a case statement. Select case. And I'm going to look at the value that's got my department. My department is in column number 3, or column C. So I'm going to select on that particular value column 3. Or remember, I can, I can also do that with a, with a letter. So I can specify the column with my cell's property as a letter. Put in an end select. And thank you. Uh, no, end select is right. And then inside, I will say case. Now, I want to do something if it says general. What do I want to do? I want to set OPT general, its value property equal to true. I want to do the same thing if it says apparel. OPT apparel. O-P-P-A-R-E-L. Or outdoor. The OPT outdoor. Hmm. And what's our last one? Hunting. Hmm. What if it's none of those? I mean, it's possible the user can come in here and and uh, change something. Maybe what I'll just do is show a message box. So case else. MSGBOX. Unknown. Uh, what is this? These are departments. T A R T M E N T. Colon. I will put what we found that we didn't recognize. And I will say that it's an error, critical. And that's it. I won't worry about putting a title on that. So now if it's one of the four I'm expecting, great, we'll just set it. If it's something else, we'll tell the user, hey, this said something else. We'll show them what it is. We'll get an error. Trouble is, this error is going to show before the form shows because it's, this all happens before the form is visible. That's okay. I'll click okay and then they'll see that then they'll see the problem. I'm okay with it. All right.
let's check and make sure that works. So I'll run it. Yeah, it looks like it checked hunting. Hopefully it's hunting whatever I'm on. Which row am I on? I'm on row number two. Yeah, that was hunting. I'll scroll down. So here's, I'm going to be on outdoor now, row 53. I'll run that. Hopefully it's going to show, yeah, outdoor is checked. I change it to something that's not shown, outdoor X, and run it. Unknown department, outdorks. Outdorks. I don't know what outdorks is. So at least that lets us know, hey, there's no department. I can set that to outdoor. Now the idea is when the user clicks OK, that should get changed to the proper value. You know, or if they change it to a different one, we're recategorizing this product into a different department, we want to be able to set that. So we've got to do something similar to what we did, but in reverse. So let's go build that one. I'll come to the OK button just by double clicking it. I know I went through this pretty quickly. Are you with me? Is there anyone who's trying to do this but isn't quite caught up? You're okay? All right. So now let's come up and say after we've set the name here when we click OK, let's now set this value out as well. Again, select case. Select case. I'm gonna, this is going to be a little bit unusual. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put a placeholder there for now. We'll replace all those X's with a real value later. And select. And if the one that's selected is hmm, uh, OPT Outdoor, then I'm going to put, I'm going to write Outdoor into that particular location on the worksheet. So com whatever row I'm on, column number C, its value is going to equal Outdoor. That's when I copy this, I think I'm just going to copy these four and just put them in here. So I've got general, apparel, and hunting. Hmm. All right. So here's the strange thing about this. Only one of these is going to be selected. That means only one of these values is going to be true. So what do I put here? This is a little bit backwards from how we've used the, the select case statement in the past. Typically, we put some variable expression up there with a the case, and then we see which one of those matches all these constants. In this case, we've got values that may be something or maybe something else could be either true or false here. And I'm trying to find out which one of these is true. So what do I put here where the X's are? Yeah, true. I'm trying to find out the first match between true and one of these. And the good news is only one of them is going to be true because they're mutually exclusive. VBA is going to handle that part for me, thank goodness. I don't have to worry about saying when one gets selected, uncheck the other ones. So now it'll just be whichever one has, the, that has the, the match first, it will write that value out and will be in great shape. So I should be able to make that correction now. Unknown department, outdoor X. Say OK, and I can set outdoor here. Say OK, and that should write outdoor out, back out. If I change it to general, say OK, it should change it to general. Back to the code. Now, do I need a case else in this situation? Probably not. There is no way for the user to put anything besides one of those four choices. So I could put a case else here and just say if it's not one of these three, it's got to be hunting. I'll leave, it, I'll leave it as it is. Yep. Oh, what if they didn't select any? You're right, because it can come up without, um, because we've given it the ability not to find one of those. Yeah, yeah, you're absolutely right. So in this case, if they don't select any, what's it going to do? Will it find a match between any of these? 
No, so it's not going to make any change to column C of our active row. And I'm, I, think that's, I think that's the right thing to do. If there was something that was invalid there, they didn't change it, don't change it. Yep. Oh, yeah. So, yeah, so here, let's do this. We could say case else. Uh, and then we can do a couple of things. Message box, msgbox, select, and um, what's it called? A department. Select a department. No, no. So the comment is, but hey, it's a radio button. They've got to have one selected. And the answer is, because when we read this, we said, you know, if it's not any of these, leave them, put up a message box, but don't select any of them. It's possible to get this form open with none of them selected. And if they don't click on any of them, still none will be selected. And so it's possible to get here and say, yeah, none of these are selected. And what we're saying here, the question is, well, can we force them to select one? Yeah. At this point, we say, hey, select a, select a department. And then, let's see, that's MSG box. And then we say exit sub. So we will skip the line that says unload me. And so that will have exactly the behavior that you're looking for. If the user, if it, if it came up and, and there wasn't one to select, and the user didn't select one, it's now going to say, hey, you, you got to select one of these. I'm not going to let you close until you select it. At least you can't save. Could you still cancel? We don't have a cancel button, but you got the red X. You always got the red X in the upper right hand corner. You could do that. That would do it. So you don't get to change anything to this record if you don't choose a department. That's what this says. And we can make this critical. And data entry error. Well, let's just go ahead and test that. Change this back to General Sherman. That's Sermon, General Sermon, Sherman. Run the form. Hey, there's an unknown department, General Sherman. That's fine. I'm not going to change it. I'll click OK. Hey, you got to select a department. I really don't want to. OK, I'll select one. And then it lets me through. And that should, of course, change it back to General. Okie dokie. Half hour to go. Okay, so what I want to do now is I want to deal with our discount. In the other class, looking at discount, we said we want to be able to make it so the user can choose multiple discounts, um, not just one. We did that with a list box. You'll need to know how to work with a list box to be able to do the user form project. So I encourage you to go watch that, that video. You'll also need to know how to work with a combo box which we didn't get to in the last class. So I'm going to take you down the road of doing this promotion with a combo box. Uh, and so you'll see how to use a combo box here. You'll want to go watch the other video to see how to treat it as a list box. So here's what we want to do. We want to say we've got, in fact, we have a list of promotions over here in our promos tab. So we've got several promotions here. We want the user to be able to pick from this list. We don't want to hard code this list into our form. We want to read this list off the form so that the, if the user says, you know, we got a new promotion. You know, maybe we're, we're creating a new promotion that's, uh, let's see, what would be a good promotion here? We got, uh, or maybe it's like you get a, some kind of free coupon. Maybe it's like, you know, you know free shipping on your next order or 10% off your next order. Uh, so we'll just call this um, uh, coupon, C-O-U-P-O-N. I don't know. The point is, if the user does something like this, we want to be able to say, Oh, yeah, let's, uh, let's bring that into the list. And so let's see what it takes to do that. So the combo box is this right here. It's called a combo box because it's a combination between a list box, which is just a square that shows all the items, and a text box. So you just type in what you want. So the combo box, you can type it in or click on the drop-down arrow, and you'll pick it from the list. It's got characteristics of both. So I'll bring on a combo box. And I'll just draw that, I don't know, probably right in here. I'm going to give it a name. I'll call it CBO Promo.
And I'll put a label above this so we can say promotion. So we can tell the user what is it that we're looking at. We are looking at a caption of promotion. Promotion. Okay. So now, this one's now going to be a little bit more complex because we've got two steps that we have to do. One, we've got to first put the list of possible values into it. And then two, once that list is in, we've got to decide which of the promotions is already recorded in the worksheet. And then, and then say that's the selected one. So let's start by putting the list of options in it. So again, I'll, I'll just double click on my user form. That'll bring me up to my code for my user form. Initialize the only event, and so it picks that one. And I'll come to the bottom of this. I'm going to put a comment in here. So here we are. Uh, this is the department. And then here we're going to do the promotion. All right. So now we got to read across the promos. We got to read across all the contiguous data starting from A1 of the promos sheet. Hmm. Hmm. So let's do this. Let's create a variable called r. This will be a local variable. Dim r as a long. And let's do this. This would be something different. This is a, kind of a different approach to this than we've taken before. So let's say with, use the with block, and we're going to refer to that particular cell starting with A1 on that particular sheet. So sheets, the name of the sheet is promos. And the cell we want, or we'll just say range A1. And with. Okay. So inside this with block, we're going to do multiple things with that particular cell. And what we really want to do is we just want to, we just want to kind of keep executing. We want to have some kind of loop that just keeps going until we bump into a blank cell. And so I'm going to do until, hmm, now that range A1, I want to offset R rows from it. So how do I refer to range A1 in, on that sheet inside this with block? Say the question. Okay, so I, well, R is going to be keeping track of, it's just going to be an integer variable. I got to refer to this particular cell. And that's the whole trick of the with block is that when I'm inside a with block, if I start anything with a dot, if, it, if a dot leads it, it says, oh, just pretend that whatever's right here is in front of that dot. So until that cell's offset, R rows and no columns. But I don't, the columns isn't required, so I can just leave that off. It'll say no columns. So that should refer to that cell offset how many rows? R, but how many is R right now? Yeah, zero. It's been initialized. We haven't changed it, so that'll be zero. So that that this will be range A1. Do until that cell's value is equal to a zero length string. If it's blank, we'll get out. If not, we're then ready to write. We're ready to bring that into our list box. Now we called it, I'm sorry, our combo box. We called it CBO promo. Oh, I do need a loop. Yeah, yeah, I do that all the time. Instead of next, I want to say loop. So the name of my object is, I can never remember it, so let me do me.cbo, there it is, cbo promo. It has a method that allows me to add an item into the list. What do you think the method's called? Add item, there it is, it's the first choice. I then just tell it what I want to add. So from range A1 on the promo sheet, offset zero rows. Now we're going to increment R. 
And we're going to come back. Now R will be 1. We'll offset from range A1, one row. Is that blank? Nope. Add it in. Increment R and keep doing that until we've added them all in. Fancy. That, sh that should do that part. Let's see if that part works. I'm going to go ahead and run this code, and hopefully it's going to fill the list in my combo box with all those promoters. There's like five of them. Drop down the list. There they are. Full price, which is another way of saying no promotion. F free shipping, free warranty, buy one, get one free, or the coupon. So the first step is done. The list box portion is there. Now we've got to take a look at whichever is on my active cell and say that's the one we want to select. That's actually pretty easy. So after we've listed, loaded the promotions up, let's see, what column is that? That's in column H. So all we need to do is set CBO promo, set its value. So here's where we treat it more like a text box. We set its value equal to whatever value is in column H. And if that matches one of the items in the list, when we drop down that list, you'll see it's selected. It really will. It'll, it'll, it'll keep it in sync. And so now writing this value out to the worksheet is also quite easy because I can just treat it like a text box. So I'll come back up to here where I'm writing values out. and just reverse these and I'm in good shape. Take whatever's on the, the, uh, the combo box, the promo combo box, and write it, out to the uh, write it out to the worksheet in the appropriate location. Just check and make sure that works. Right now it says full price. I'm going to change that to free shipping. We'll say OK. And it has written out free shipping. That's beautiful. Now, if I've got multiple values that I'm trying to select, as we did you know, in the other class, it's a lot more complicated because I have, to write, I have to write many values into this cell. I've got to scan across it, see which ones are selected, write them out. Uh, and you'll be doing that in the project, so you'll want to go, go watch that particular part. But here's how the combo box works. Questions here? All right. Well, let's go ahead and bring on the, uh, let's, let's do another control. Next control I want to do is the image control. So let's see. Hmm, I kind of need some space for my image. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to move my promotion over here a little more to the right. I'm going to put my image right in here. So here's my image control. It looks like a nice little uh, landscape. We've got mountains and the sun or the moon or something sitting up there. I'm just going to do a click and drag and put my image control right there. The image control, there are two things I can do it. You know, one, I can just set the value for this image control right now at design time. I'll just go ahead and do that. And we're going to change this, but I'll go ahead and put, a, I'll put an image in here. The way I do that is I come to the picture property. So I have the image selected. Oh, let's give it a name. I'm going to call this uh, IMG product. Maybe just IMG pro, image prod, P-R-O-D, image prod. And then I'm going to come to the picture property. When I click on the little builder button that comes with the picture property, it says, great, which picture do you want to plug in here? Well, I want this one for my downloads directory, something called products and pics. I've got all these pictures to choose from. I'll pick one that pleases me. There's, I have no idea what that is. Oh, that's nice. It's like the car compass my granddad used to have on his, the dash of his Buick. There it is. Now, here's the thing I want to stress about this. I have just imported the bytes from this picture. That whole picture file is now embedded in this image control. If I go delete that picture off my hard drive, it has no effect on this picture that's here. I have a copy of it inside the form. It's right here. That's good. The question is, does it have to be loaded into memory for that to work? Does what have to be loaded into memory?
So, oh, the question is, do I have to run this form for that picture to actually be saved? And the answer is no. I've just, at this point, that picture is inside this form. I do have to save it. I mean, I've got to save the workbook for it to be saved, but it's, it's there right now. Okay. There's a couple of properties I can change about this. So one of the things I can do is I can say, uh, there's, a, there's a property called zoom. And so, not zoom. Uh, now I've forgotten what it's called. It's like, oh, I've got to have it selected. Hold on a second. Special effect. Ah, picture size mode. So picture size mode can be one of three things. One is clip. And that means it's just going to, it's going to, you've got a picture. It's already a particular size. If the whole picture can fit inside the image control, you get it all. If it doesn't all fit, it just gets trimmed off. It'll show as much of it as it can, but it's, it's going to show you the actual pixels that are there. That's one. Second one is that you can stretch. If I set it to stretch, whatever shape your image control is, it's going to fill it up. If that, if it, if that means it's you know, going to really get distorted, that's okay. Or I can say zoom. And zoom will say, I want to see the whole picture undistorted. And so if the picture is small, it will stretch it, keeping the aspect ratio, until it bounces into a boundary of the image form. Or if it's too big, it'll shrink it down until it can show it all, but it will maintain the aspect ratio. That's the one I'm going to pick. I'm going to pick zoom as the property. So now if I show this form, that picture will stick around. Oops. And of course, uh, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense to have the same picture for each one. And so we're going to change the code so that as I go to a different one, it'll bring up the right picture for that one. But the, but the first thing I can do is if I just want a static picture, this is the control to do it. I just set it at design time. I've brought, I've brought that picture. Maybe it's a company logo or something that I want to put on the form. I can do that. But now let's make it so it reads the picture from the, from the data. Let's take a look at our data. So right here in column G, I have the file name of that picture. I don't know the path. That's why it was important for us to put this workbook at the same location as the picture directory is, because I'm going to infer the path from the location of the workbook. So let's give that a shot. So now, same thing, when the data gets loaded, I'm going to put the picture in. So now let's put the picture. And here we're going to say, hmm. Name of the picture is IMG prod. It has a property called picture. We're going to set it equal to something. Now here's the trick. We got to set it equal to a stream of bytes. We got to pick one of these pictures. What do we Let me show you what we have to set this equal to. All right, here's one of these pictures. I'm going to open this picture not with a picture editor, but I'm going to open it with a text editor. That is what I've got to set the picture property to. It's all these different characters. A bunch of these characters are characters you can't even print. There's no and EOT. You can't even type these characters. I've got to get it to equal this. Fortunately, there's a function built into VBA that I can say, go look at that file, and it will return me the stream of bytes for that picture. It's called load something. I can't remember what it's called. Load picture or load image. Let's see. Equals load picture. Ah, oh, good. I just got to give it the file name. Well, file name is, and then I have a full path to the file. So it's called this workbook dot path concatenated with the application's path separator concatenated with picks. No, is it called picks? called picks, concatenate, oh, this is ugly. Let me go ahead and make this so you can see the whole thing. This workbook and the path separator and underscore picks and the path separator And so that should say whatever the whole path is of the workbook, then get to the picks folder, and now all we need is the file name. 
and that file name is in column G. And then close our parentheses. We need parentheses around this because this is going to return something. The value it's going to return is hideous. It's a long stream of bytes for the picture. And that's exactly what we need to be for the picture property. So because we're treating this like a function, we're bringing back the value. We've got to put parentheses around the argument list. We send it this full description of a path. It should get that picture and plop it right there into the picture property, which should let us see that image. File not found. Oh, thank you. Yeah, it's a column G. Thank you. Now we've got it. There it is. And go choose a different row and run the form. Oh, I think that's also a decoy, but it looks like a duck that's like put its butt up in the air and trying to catch something underwater. Or something. So now, depending on the row, it'll show the right picture. So that's kind of nice. Go back to the code. Questions on this code? So that's how you manipulate an image control at runtime. Only really one more control that we have to deal with so that we've kind of covered the, the set of controls you need for the project. Question in the back. Oh, good question. So the question is, is that default one still loaded into the form? And is there any reason to have it there? The answer is yes and no. I mean, the first question is yes. The answer, second question is no. It's still there. It's still taking up space in the form. It's you know, made our application that much bigger, a few thousand characters bigger, a few, a few K bigger. And there's no reason to have it there because it's going to get replaced by whichever one we're currently showing. So how would I get rid of it? Just come back to the form and delete, find the picture property, and then just delete it out. Right. Hit delete, that would go away. Good question. All right, last control that you'll need for the project is the checkbox control. Checkbox control is just like an option button in a set of one. Well, not quite. You can set it and unset it independent of any other checkbox. So let's just, uh, let's see, do we even have a checkbox that, do we, I don't think we have any property that really makes sense for a checkbox here. Uh, so we don't really have anything that's just yes or no. So, here, let's do this. Let's add another column. We'll call it uh, status. And it'll either be blank or it'll be discontinued. Is this a discontinued product? All right, so we've got column K here that we're going to use to manipulate this checkbox. And again, I've just added this column, that data you don't have in the, in the workbook that we downloaded. So I'll bring a checkbox on. Just like the option button, the text, the checkbox has, kind of has a caption built into it. I mean, it's got a place to, uh, to put the, the name. So I'll call this chk status, and the caption will be uh, discontinued. So if it is discontinued, there'll be a check there. If it's not discontinued, there won't be a check there. So let's go ahead and set that up. We've got to do two things, right? When we read the form, we've got to make sure we've checked it appropriately. When we read the data and open the form, and then when we hit save, we've got to write it back out. This should just be an if statement. There's the picture. Here's the status. If, what did I say we were on? We're calling K. If column K's value is equal to discontinued. Oh, actually, here, let's do this. Here's, a, here's kind of a trickier way to do it. Instead of an if statement, we'll do this. Discontinued, discontinued. 
We could say, if it's discontinued, do one thing, otherwise do another. But this right here, this is, this is itself an expression, right? If I was saying, if this, then, what does that evaluate to between the if and the then? Let me go ahead and write it in and ask the question. If, then. It's either going to be true or false. In fact, when it is discontinued, it evaluates the true. When it is something besides discontinued, it evaluates the false. That's exactly what I have to set the value property of my CHK status checkbox to. And so in, instead of saying, if it's true, make it true, otherwise make it false, I will just set it equal to CHK status dot value equals. First time I saw a line of code that looked like this, it completely blew my mind. I got three things. It's like an assignment statement with a something else right in the middle. This I would get by itself. This I could get by itself. Well, what the? <laughs> it's got three equal signs. This first equal sign is what? It's an assignment statement. We are saying, take whatever is over here on the right and assign it into here. This one is not an assignment. This is a comparison. And so this part will get evaluated to true or false. Or whatever it gets evaluated to, we plop, in, we plop into this particular location. Okay. So how many of you look at that and go, I don't ever want to see a line of code like that again? Yeah, yeah you know, if then, it, if, I think it, follow, it reads a lot better. But, this, oh, but if then, else, that's five lines. This is one. I like it. <laughs> Plus, you're going to see stuff like this out there in the wild, so not a bad idea to see it. Something similar over here. Let's see. So here I want to say if what's on the form is discontinued. Uh, oh, actually, I think this one. No, this one I'm not trying to write out true or false. This one I have to use an if statement. So I will say if the status value is either going to be true or false, then it's discontinued, else it's blank. So this one takes a little more. But now we'll appropriately set the checkbox in when we open the form. However the user sets it, we'll write it out. Let's give that a shot. I'm going to be on a discontinued one right now. I'll run the form. Comes up as checked. I'll uncheck it, say OK. It's erased it. Open it again. Comes up unchecked. Check it. Say OK, and it's put discontinued in. And so there was the last block we worked on. Say the question again? That's on the OK, yeah. So this is a, on the OK is where we're writing the data back out. Okay, so folks, the only thing that you didn't see here that you need for the project is a list box. Uh, that list box example probably takes about 15 minutes to go through. We can't cover it today. But you've got a video on it posted on today's schedule. All, so we're going to have two different videos for today. Unusual that we have two videos. But I will label them as to which one's showing the list box and which one's showing the combo box so that you can uh, go through and review that. Questions? All right.